welcome to PRI's podcast. I'm your host, Rowena Ichon. Some of our listeners might think that PRI is the only free market think tank in California, but that's not the case. We get a lot of help from our friends. In this episode, our guest is Will Swain, president of the California Policy Center. The center's big issue are the unions, and they're doing a fantastic job of educating Californians on the power of the unions in the state from their lavish pensions to their holdover public education, and of course, to their unparalleled influence in Sacramento. And since it's a season, we also chat about California politics. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Pacific Research Institute's podcast, Will. Thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me, guys. As the president of the California Policy Center, uh, based in Tustin, talk to our listeners about your organization and some of the current work you're doing now. Sure. I love it when you say based in Tustin. Uh, we prefer to call it the Paris of Central Orange County. For those who don't know where Tustin is, it is almost dead center in Orange County. We have uh, staff all over the state, Central Valley, Sacramento, San Jose. We mostly work remote. It's a big state. We're a relatively small organization, and we were founded around the issues of government union power. I think our first early project really was publishing Steve Greenhut's book, Plunder. You guys may know that book. Oh, sure. Yeah, so I, it was a bunch of uh, donors down here in Orange County who came together because Steve Greenhut at that point was writing the, you know, for the commentary section of the Orange County Register, and government unions had become kind of his wheelhouse. He was working that beat all the time, looking at the connection between how government unions take dues money, then run campaigns for public officials who then get elected and sit across the negotiating table from the very union leaders who helped elect them. So Steve wrote that book. I think it came out 2009 or so. A bunch of the same people got together in 2012 to run the Prop 32 Paycheck Protection Campaign. And in the experience of raising and spending $30 million, a lot of the people who went on to form California Policy Center recognized that the unions could not only match you dollar for dollar, but could outspend you dramatically if they chose to. And any attempt at reforming the relationship between government unions and California governments, whether at the municipal or state level, was going to run into the union narrative. The narrative, which is, you know, unions are good for poor people. Unions are good for the middle class. Unions represent the working people of California. That they they just owned that narrative and that this was going to be much more a, you know, almost a war of attrition in dismantling that lie or myth if you prefer. So they formed California Policy Center 2013, 2014. And we launched as mostly a white paper organization doing financial analyses of state government and the impact of uh, public employee compensation and various crazy California rules that protect uh, union leaders. When I was hired, I began to leverage my experience as a a lefty in getting much more into organizing. So our, our current work is really much more oriented toward, for example, our parent unions, where we work with parents of students in low-income neighborhoods and failing schools to help them understand what their rights are, how they can really lobby for and militate for better education. And on the other side, we work with local elected officials throughout the state. That was a project that I helped work on on the left back in the 80s and 90s. And very powerful, you know, these municipal officials at the state and county and school board level, they have loads of authority that many of them just simply aren't aware of. We're much more involved in that at present and really focused on a Supreme Court decision in Janus v. AFSCME, if your listeners know about that. I think all of us at PRI and California Policy Center certainly are anxiously waiting for the Supreme Court to issue its decision, which, fingers crossed, promises to be a landmark ruling for worker freedom now that we have Justice Gorsuch on the court. So what impact do you think a positive ruling in the Janus case would have on California? Well, I uh, the I guess the bottom line is it could be and is likely to be, if we get the right decision, it is likely to be transformative for those who haven't followed the Supreme Court case. It's very much like Friedrichs was a couple of years ago. That's Rebecca Friedrichs, an Orange County school teacher who sued the CTA. That went all the way to the Supreme Court, of course. It looked like she would have won 5-4. And then uh, Justice uh, Antonin Scalia died about four to, I don't know, maybe six weeks after the hearing. So that case deadlocked at 4-4 and it went back to the Ninth Circuit, which had already decided that, nope, this is uh, really uh, a standard case where you have to join a union if you want a government job. Right behind it is the case of Mark Janis, an Illinois state social worker who's making a very similar claim that the government cannot compel anyone 
to join a political organization and unions are political. If the case goes our way, bottom line could be hugely transformative. And my only stipulation, the only reason I say could be, is that California's public employee unions raise about a billion, with a B, a billion dollars per year in dues. That's that's real money. The left loves to talk about dark money and how the Koch brothers are financing everything. But the fact is the major unions in California, you know, four or five of them generate a billion dollars a year. If you're running for school board or city council or a county board job and, you know, you need to raise $100,000, the unions can just wildly outspend you. Janus has the possibility of liberating workers. Number, you know, number one, just allowing them to opt out of their public employee unions or public unions and save the membership dues in the case of teachers, $1,200 per year. That's that's real money for people who would like to see a one or two percent increase, you know, in the next several years. You know, in the, in the case of workers who are tired of seeing their dollars spent by the California Teachers Association all over the country and on issues with which they disagree or really not protecting them or promoting education, I think a lot of members will simply choose to opt out. When I say a lot, maybe 10 percent. But the, the fight will be to really get the message to the rest of their colleagues. The unions have a monopoly on who can talk to their members and they do everything they can to obscure any kind of message by just amplifying up to 11 everything, every claim they ever make about the billionaires who are trying to control the government or whatever. We're really looking at a messaging campaign that can reach out to those workers, primarily through social media, email, direct mail to their homes, uh, letting them know what their rights are post Janus. You know, it really is true when you're talking about the union influence being in Sacramento for two decades now, people don't see the unions when they roll out their force, especially during budget fights or big legislative fights where they have a vested interest. That What they roll out rivals the most lavish production, the staging for their rallies they spend top dollar on, the the, the finest catering for, for, for the lunches for their folk. Everyone is bussed in from around the state and it's really hard for any other interest to combat that kind of money and power and organizations. I I guess I look at the Janus case and and wonder, is that really going to be the silver bullet that begins to even the playing field here? Or what can we really do to combat this huge, huge political force in California? Well, the example that I use when people ask that question is, you know, first of all, I would always say there's no magic bullet. There is no silver bullet. There's there's no uh, magic solution. This really is a struggle for control of the government uh, and returning it to the people. You you paint him such a vivid description of what it's like to see the union roll out. I've seen it primarily at the local level where they can pack a school board meeting or a county board of supervisors meeting where, you know, otherwise honorable police and firefighters are, you know, dressed in their uniforms and arms folded across barrel chests, standing at the back of the room and glaring at public officials during negotiations. It's it's pretty impressive. I was in Costa Mesa, for example, when a reform group took over the city council there and started to try to reform the pension problem. And the union was able to, you know, have strikes and walkouts and people just thronging City Hall and just, I called it the two hours of hate during public comment. Every week there was a meeting and the unions would just lock up the public comment section, lock up the seats, and not just kind of vaguely threaten, but literally try to have jailed public officials who are simply trying to reform a corrupt system. Our, I, I, I point to Michigan and the right to work law that passed there in 2012. And I point to that because I think its lessons are really important. In 2012, right to work passes in Michigan. And for a full year, nothing happens. Nobody leaves the public employee unions for a full year. I mean, it's just uh, negligible, I mean, under a half a percent. And at that point, um, allies of ours, primarily those at the Mackinac Center, named for Mackinac Island, but actually uh, based in Midland, Michigan, started a, a communications campaign. They started focus groups. They talked to teachers and other public employees and found out what was keeping them from walking out. And the single most impressive answer was, I didn't know I had that right. It was as if, you know, this big decision had come down. It was headlines in the newspapers and no one really understood what their rights were. So the Mackinac folks took it upon themselves to start communicating 
communicating in 2013, 2014, and have now gotten about 30 percent of public employees out of the unions. And they've been so successful in that effort that the unions have seen a big drop off on their income. And the result of that is the first pension reformer in Michigan history. And Michigan is a very, very labor friendly state, as you likely know. But they got the first pension reform package through, um, I want to say, last year, a uh, year before they blocked a state tax hike that was ostensibly for, you know, building safety in the schools and roads and that sort of thing, uh, but would have gone to increase uh, public employee compensation. That lost in the state house and union officials in Michigan contacted about their now, you know, double failure said, we simply don't have the income. We simply don't have the support among our own members that we used to have. I think that's a, that is a lesson for both the, the people on the far left, the public employee union leaders, uh, their rank and file, and certainly for us. We saw that. We saw what worked. And it was just clear, coherent, simple, straightforward messaging about what rights workers have. And that's what we're prepared to do. We're prepared to talk directly to public officials and their employees about what their rights are. Well, you mentioned that, thought that about 10 percent of union members would leave the unions. Would that be just the teachers unions? Because I'm wondering, there are firefighters, there are the police, that they may be the first to exit because I think that many of them are probably more conservatives versus the teachers who are mostly progressive. Well, I would, yeah, I would tend, Rowena, to, to agree with you. That, that would be my instinct, but for the evidence we have in other places, which shows that, strangely, this is less, long term, this is less a political decision. In other words, it's less that uh, firefighters or cops who do tend to be Republican or at least, uh, you know, conservatively independent, let's say, stay in the union. And you can imagine why their union got them the, the wealthiest, the most luxurious retirement package in the entire nation. If you're a cop or a firefighter, especially firefighters who can work, uh, you know, 30 years, retire at 50, cops do now that I think about it, uh, both police and firefighters can be out at 50 if they've worked 30 years and they are fully vested in a program that gives them the highest of their average the last two or three years of their service. And this can mean people who are, you know, 50 years old, minimally retiring with incomes of $250,000 per year, plus health care for the rest of their lives. Uh, firefighters in California on average live to be about 84. That means that we are paying for more years in retirement, 34, than years of service, 30. And it means an entire generation and a half of new firefighters coming in at the same rates. So they, they tend to be very supportive of their union. I've been inside um, in my previous life as a consultant to police and firefighters unions, and I can tell you whatever their personal politics, and they do tend to be conservative when it comes to the union, they see themselves as distinct. They are a unique breed, a, a people set apart by their honorable service, and they don't see any co any collision between their own income and the income of, of other unions. They, they tend to not like teachers. They tend to not like the folks who work at the DMV or the city hall. They tend to think that they're liberals and kind of getting too much money and the taxes should be cut. This is why so many of our police and firefighters end up retiring to places like Idaho or Utah, where the taxes are lower. So, you know, a quarter of a million dollars per year on the Snake River, that's that's pretty good income. So we find that cops and firefighters least likely to exit, most likely to exit. Your sort of American Federation of State County Municipal Employees, AFSME, SEIU workers, you know, they tend to be administrative workers who can see the other people around them getting lots of money, and their fear is legitimately that the money won't be there when they retire. On pensions, uh, CalPERS just presented its bill to the legislature for it, our unfunded state pension obligation costs, and it's asking for $6.3 billion in this year's state budget, which is stunning, and it's only going to get worse. But there's another court case going on right now, and PRIs filed an amicus brief in the case that challenges the California rule. And hearing some of the comments of the justices, you know, it's providing some kind of hope to taxpayers payers that relief may be on the way to solve our pension crisis. What are your thoughts? Do you think Sacramento is ever going to get its act together in enacting reasonable pension reform? And would reform of the California rule really make a difference? Those are both really good questions, of course. And as you know, I've read PRI's uh, amicus brief, it's 
brilliant and it observes, I think, as a number of them do on our side, that there is constant harm being done every single time a paycheck goes out to a retiree through CalPERS, the, the pension state pension system. There's new injury to taxpayers who have no authority over this. There's no ability to correct a wrong. And so this wrong continues in perpetuity merely because it exists. I can think of horrific examples, metaphors, analogies rather, like a guy breaks into your house one time and because you don't complain at the time, he's therefore allowed forever to break into your house at any time he wants. This is the nature of the California rule. A, a pension, a benefit once vested in an employee can never be changed. How would that work in a private company? It wouldn't. You know, No private company could survive that. The ability to be elastic in your spending, to cut costs in order to stay in business and provide service. We just don't have that. It's, it's not available to us as taxpayers, as residents of California. The question of the California rule is it must be reformed. Logic dictates it. It's in the law that we can change it. Uh, you and I could get into the weeds on this, the three of us, about why this is, why the California rule is illegal, really a violation of, of not just precedent, but law. Your other question really, though, is will Sacramento ever get its act together? I would love to hear from you, Tim, because you've been in there. You've seen where the bodies are buried, I suppose. I, and in some cases, I've gotten my shovel out and buried some of those bodies myself. Yeah. So, you know, you're you're probably in an even better position than I to talk about what it'll take. My, my sense is really simple, that until you disconnect the, the dark money that flows out of public employee unions to candidates who then get into office, and despite the terrible conflict of interest they've got with those, those campaign contributors, they turn around and vote for hefty increases and enhanced benefits and protections for union leaders. It is one of the most grotesque abuses. It takes place in broad daylight, obscured only by the fact, I suppose, that the unions claim this is all for our good. But it is a crime. I mean, if, if we saw any business in California, Facebook or you know Boeing or any aircraft corporation or Tesla giving money to candidates in the hundreds of millions of dollars per year and then bringing business before those groups of people without a full disclosure, without a complaint from legislators. I just can't imagine people not wigging out. It, it strikes me as such an obvious abuse. When we really break up that conveyor belt of cash into the political system, I think it'll free up not just conservatives, of course, but it'll free up lots and lots of Democrats and others who have have to constantly look over their shoulder every time they vote. Is the union going to drive me out in the primary? Are they going to clobber me? Your description of folks showing up from the unions, you know, bust in, fed, handed a, a, a picket sign, a placard, a banner, uh, ordered to march around with bullhorns in Sacramento. We've seen that in our cities, our counties. That ability to mobilize antagonism and support is the only thing that keeps this, I would call it, Soviet-style economic system or political system in place. Break that up and we might actually have a free chance for a more vibrant political system with people from the farther left and the more moderate left and moderate Republicans not worrying so much about who's coming up behind them with a billion dollars to drop on them. David Crane, who we've interviewed for the podcast, and I worked with him back in the Schwarzenegger days, he's really trying to lead that charge on the outside to elect reform-minded Democrats and Republicans uh, to the legislature. But there's been a push for, quote-unquote, campaign reform in the last couple of years, and I believe it was finally enacted where they want to have in television commercials or advertising that you have to put the logo of the three big funders of that campaign. And the Democrats want it to this oil company or this evil business entity is behind them. I'm interested to see for Democratic candidates when it's this union or that union, what effect would that have? You know, if you see in a TV ad or in a mailing, you literally Literally, this is the public employee funded seal of approval. And I don't know if that would cut good or bad. I think at present, you know, to go back to uh, the conversations beginning, the unions in California have done a good job of putting the, the having the narrative, you know, in their hands. And that narrative is we're unions. We stand for working people. They're all billionaires or fascists or white nationalists or Klan members. They're bad people. Until we begin to disentangle that narrative 
until we begin to win and show how the unions explicitly control California politics all the way down to the local level. I think that it doesn't hurt them. I, I think that they've got a, you know, they've got a good brand. I don't think they deserve it in the sense that I, I, I believe it's untrue, but they have the money to make it true. What's that old saying? Uh, freedom of the press belongs to the man who owns one. They really do have the biggest amplifier, the biggest megaphone, microphone. They, they really are able to get people to turn. I've seen this for decades now that it's like a swinging watch in a magician's trick or a hypnotist trick. You know, they, they mention union, working people, family, and everybody kind of nods because we're all kind of stuck in something that was a narrative that began to take shape in the 1930s. And it's been really hard to break that up despite evidence that these unions don't really support anybody but themselves. Unions aren't the only big spenders of, of dark money. The California Policy Center has done quite a bit of work on transparency in government spending. On your website, you've compiled a database of the 100,000 Club, or state retirees with top state pensions and profiles of how local governments are operating. In your view, why is this commitment to government transparency so important? Again, this comes back to the, the union narrative. The argument that people are underpaid, their members don't make enough money, is discredited as soon as you start to show the salaries of some of these people. And this this is, you know, by no means a, a problem of every single public employee who ever works. There are public employees who work, you know, 35, 40 years and retire on pensions in the, you know, 20000 or 30000 or $40,000 range. We're not talking about those people. You can go, you know, the members of the $100,000 per year club, that is retirees from government work who make in excess of $100,000. It grows every year exponentially. And so the problem is more widespread. So I think part of the reason that we are so committed to that is that the unions were able to say for years that their members were underpaid. If you go to transparentcalifornia.com, which we worked uh, to create with our friends out in Nevada Policy Research Institute, NPRI, uh, that database was the I believe the first of its kind to really show the names, the job titles and the incomes of every California public employee. That number now stands at 1.5 million people, but it's also got retiree information. You can go find my mother in there, an ex-school teacher, um, John L. Swaim. Hey, mom, this issue of, well, you know, we're, we're the working people. We're constantly uh, undermined economically. We're at a disadvantage is easily tested by the union's own data, by the government's own data, which in, in turn, if it's the government's data. It's our data. It's the public's data. It's our right to know. The government works for us. I was pulled over by a policeman one time and my son, uh, who is as mouthy as I am, told the police officer when he got snide, you work for us. And the policeman, without missing a beat, reaches into his pocket, pulls out a quarter and says, Here, here's your contribution from last year. You're welcome to a refund. That's how they, they think, you know, that each one of us spends just so little. But if you go on this website, you can begin to see the outlines of the problem. I'll tell you my favorite story. Last year, a colleague of ours, Mark Jaffe, who now works at Reason Foundation, brilliant guy, Mark Jaffe did this wonderful analysis of the faculty and staff at UC Berkeley's Center for the Study of Income Inequality, I believe it's called. You can find this on the California Policy website. And what he found was that the guys who were complaining about income inequality at Berkeley, uh, you know, these faculty members who study this problem of income inequality make not just in excess of 100000 not just in excess of 200000 but in some cases more than $250,000, $300,000 per year studying the problem, quote unquote, of income inequality. And when they retire, they'll get to keep a huge chunk of that cash as an annual pension. So you can really just kind of examine this problem of, you know, who makes the money and understand why an AFSCME worker or an SEIU worker or a school teacher, especially a young school teacher, would be really offended by the idea that some of these other people are making so much money. If we, we suspect that that a huge number of visitors to our Transparent California website, that a huge number of those visitors are actually perhaps people who are in government just wondering, like, how much does the guy in the next desk or the fire department make compared to how much I make? And that awareness can lead to, I think, really informed action on the part of these employees to understand that the system really is rigged against them by people who make huge amounts of money. I could tell you more stories along this line, but I see that time is running short. So, Will, we're in the middle of uh, half halfway through the uh, 2018 legislative session, and it seems like our friends at the state capitol give us no shortage of entertaining material to write and comment on. And I think if you were to have a theme for this year's session, it's really the session of resistance. 
and lawmakers, many of whom are, you know, especially some on the left are looking over their left shoulders at primary challenge, and they're they're trying to burnish their anti-Trump uh, credentials. So what are your thoughts on this year's session really being more about scoring political points than anything else? The most insightful piece I've read on this was a guy named David French at the National Review. David wrote a brilliant piece on a proposal in the state legislature to ban any book, to ban books for sale in California, any transaction involving books that suggested that sexual orientation was anything but fluid. And that, you know, to put it in more contemporary terms, what that really means is any, I guess, evangelical Christian or traditional conservative might look at gender identity as fixed and therefore look at this idea that, you know, you are permanently gay as a problem, right? I don't happen to share that perspective, but some people do, and they have the right under the First Amendment to talk about it, or did, uh, until this bill passes in the state legislature. French's argument wasn't just to blast off on this crazy bill, because as as you say, Tim, we have myriad, a plethora of bills moving through all the time that just shock the senses and befuddle the, the sane and sober. So it wasn't just that. It was that David French said, look, he was speaking to the left. He was saying, you want to know why people don't abandon Trump? for his his problems, you know, his personal failings or his political shortcomings as you see them. You wonder why Republicans don't leave and flood into the Democratic Party. This is why. Instead of reaching out and becoming more moderate, more agreeable, more big tent, more flexible with uh, personal politics or religious perspectives, the left has doubled down on this kind of um, Leninist, disciplined messaging, and there is no room for disagreement, no room for conversation. You can't even talk with people who might disagree with you without insulting them and or banning their ideas. So I think that's the feature that is most notable to me, that at a time when a lot of Californians, even among Republicans, were unsettled about Donald Trump, the, the candidate, the, the, the members of our of our legislature have, as French says, doubled down on the extremism and made it very difficult for people to move out of the Republican Party, to abandon Donald Trump, and to move into the Democratic Party. I, I, I'm not sure if that makes sense, but my sense is that the left has just gone too far. They have ter- terribly miscalculated and lost, fumbled an opportunity. We're in the middle of election season and the two leading candidates, according to most polls for governor, are Gavin Newsom and Antonio Villaraigosa. If either of them are elected governor, what do you think are the major policy shifts that we'll see under their respective administrations? And, and also, we've got a lot of ballot initiatives coming up. And which one of those do you think is going to be the most important? I, I, I acknowledge that right now it looks like Villaraigosa and Newsom will be uh, one and two, but John Cox is right in there. I just, I kind of wonder, I didn't see Brexit coming. I didn't see Trump winning. Is it possible there's enough dissatisfaction with somebody like Newsom or Villaraigosa that John Cox could get in there? I'm not sure. You know, there are other Republicans running, of course. There's also John Chang, uh, the state treasurer. But let's go with your hypothetical that it's going to be Newsom and Villaraigosa. I know that in trying to distinguish himself from Gavin Newsom, Antonio Villaraigosa has said some things that have attracted the attention of more moderate Democrats and even a lot of Republicans. Uh, He's been friendly on charter schools, for instance. I fear that unless we fix the entire context, that is, again, the context of union cash flowing just unheeded into the political system, it's just just not going to matter much which of them gets into office. Uh, I talk to well-meaning Republicans and Democrats all the time who are very excited about Marshall Tuck because Marshall Tuck, running for uh, state superintendent of education, has said nice things likewise about um, charter schools and school choice, mostly charter schools. But you know, there's another position where his actual power would be severely limited by the context of the commission that more or less reports to him or he reports to them. So there's just very little elbow room in the state capitol. And Tim, you know this better than I, but it just seems to me that if you have any ambition to create reform and you're Antonio Villaraigosa, we've seen Jerry Brown 
warn people about debt. How much good has that done? Of course, Jerry has his own you know, high-speed rail projects and others that are just crazy to me. But he said some sensible things about the California rule and about public employee union power, and yet has done very little, as far as I can tell, to reverse the trajectory, to change the trajectory of, of California's finances. I have less hope, I think, for Antonio Villaraigosa, who doesn't have anything like Jerry Brown's know-how inside the governor's mansion uh, and the ability to arm twist. So I, I, I would suggest that if Gavin Newsom gets in, things are worse. If Antonio Villaraigosa gets in, they're less worse, but we're still worse than they are today. So with all of this talk about how crazy things are going on in California, I think we all might need a glass of wine. And we love nothing more than at PRI than enjoying a glass of something while talking public policy. So we always ask our guests at the end of our podcast to share their recommendation for wine or beer or favorite adult beverage that they should uh, try. So what's your recommendation for our listeners? <laughs> I, I forgot this was coming. So let me tell you that I don't drink and it's not a, a religious or, uh, you know, an Alcoholics Anonymous kind of problem. It's I just never liked the taste. My adult beverage is likely not to count as adult. I drink way too much very good coffee. I am a huge fan of really exceptional coffees. I spend some of my free time asking people, as I would you guys, what's the best coffee house in your neighborhood? You know, who, what kind of beans do they use? Where do they come from? How do they roast them? My own favorite in Orange County uh, is probably Portfolio. Um, and um, we have also the Keen Coffee House, which is run by Martin Diedrich, formerly of Diedrich Coffee, if people know him. They roast their own beans. Beans, like it's just it's absolutely amazing coffee you can tell where it comes from and I, I could go on about coffee the way most people go on about fine wine I wish I liked wine my wife loves it I can tell you this I'm sorry for such a long-winded answer the first time I drank wine I really loved it it was sacramental wine which was a stolen a guilty pleasure in the sacristy of the St. Killian Catholic Church in Mission Viejo California and shortly after that well shortly after 10 years you? after how old you will. How old were you, Will? At the time, I was uh, probably 13. I was in the eighth grade. You know, it was just a taste. But that's when I decided, like, wow, wine is really good. Then I learned that's more or less a dessert wine they had back there. So uh, that explains my affection, if I ever do drink, for really thick, sweet white wines. Um, it's very rare. I, I once drank a late harvest Chateau Saint-Michel uh, Riesling. Other people said it was, uh, you know, contemptible. I I found it absolutely beautiful, and it brought me right back to that sacristy in Mission Viejo, California, with stolen wine. Sorry, God. Well, Will, you're, you're not the only one to recommend a non-alcoholic drink. Our uh, Lance Izumi, who doesn't drink as well, he loves root beer and shakes, so you can oh, get and recommendations I love, from him. Ah, <laughs> uh, I love Lance Izumi, so <laughs> I'll have to remember that. All right. Thanks for joining us, Will. Thank you guys so much. Thanks again to our guests, Will Swaim, and to my colleague, Tim Anaya. To stay up to date with the California Policy Center, visit their website at californiapolicycenter.org. To visit the Pacific Research Institute website, go to pacificresearch.org. And while you're there, check out our blog, Right by the Bay. Also, if you're in the Los Angeles area, we invite you to a luncheon on June 29th with Andy Puzder, former CEO of CKE Restaurants, to discuss his new book, Capitalist Comeback details are all on our website. So if you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to our podcast on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. We hope you'll come back again for another episode of PRI's podcast.